Tell them something good is going to happen today to you. In Jesus' name. For he is a good God and is a loving friend. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Let's appreciate the worship team. In Jesus' name. Before you sit down, get your Bible and lift it up in the name of Jesus. Get your Bible in Jesus' mighty name and lift it up to the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Lift up your Bible and say, this is my Bible. I speak with fire and power in your bones. Say, this is my Bible. I am what my Bible says that I am. I have what my Bible says that I have. I can do what my Bible says that I can do. My Bible is the Word of God. It contains thousands of God's promises. They are all yes and amen. Therefore, by faith, I receive every covenant written in this book. In Jesus' name, say big amen. You are welcome. You can sit down in Jesus' name. It is such a beautiful day to be here with us, and I bring you greetings from Bishop Aloysius Kiza and Pastor Margaret Kiza. They are well. Amen. Can you receive the greetings? They are well, and uh, they know that you are here. They were on a mission, and they came back this morning from Barara, and it was a powerful, powerful mission. Amen. Great things happened in Imbarara. We thank God that we are part of a generation that is seeing things happening in the name of the Lord. So they came back well, and they will be joining us in the coming uh, services in Jesus' mighty name. But they love you so much, and uh, they know that you are always praying for them. Amen. And so great things are happening. As you know, we are getting ready for the annual World Revival Conference. Amen. 21st to 28th of August is the big day. And make sure you are part. Make sure you are there. Hallelujah. And the Lord will bless you. And this coming Friday, we have the Miracle Night. Amen. We have the Miracle Night this coming Friday. Those of you who are listening over the radio, those of you who are watching, we have the miracle night this coming Friday in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's open our Bibles in the book of Romans chapter 8, verse 5. Romans chapter 8 and verse 5. If you are there, say amen. Are you there? Say amen if you are there. Okay, if you are not yet there, say, oh me, in Jesus' name. Okay, we can read together. Are you ready to read together? Let's go. One, two, three, go. For those, I, I want to hear you read louder. Are you ready? One, two, three, go. For those, set their minds. But those, the things of, verse 6. Uh-huh, one, two, three, go. Uh-huh. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. In few minutes that we have, I want to share about living a life. Where divine truth overrides physical reality. Living a life where what God says is above what I see, what I hear, what I smell, and what I have. Amen. 
living a life where divine truth overrides physical reality. We are living in a world today where when you want something, you can get it easily. Easily. And we are living in a world today where people, it becomes easier to relate with other people than it becomes easier to relate with God. Or it becomes easier to relate with what the world and the people around us are saying than it is to relate with what God is saying. For example, if somebody is seated here listening to me and you want to know what is love, your first alternative will be to go to the internet and find out what love is. Amen. Most people, that is the way they are living life. That if they want to know what is peace, what is joy, the first thing is to look for Mr. Who? Uh -huh. Hallelujah. Is to look for Mr. Google. So, we are living in a generation where it is, it is easier for somebody to relate with what another person is saying than to relate with what God is saying. Amen. But that is not the mind of God concerning us as children. He wants us to live a life where what he is saying, before I go to find out from any other place, I go there to get a confirmation of what the Lord has said. Amen. I go there to get a confirmation of what God has already told me. And when I get there to that platform, whatever it may be, when I get to that platform and see what another man posted there, then I will compare. The Bible says, judge the spirits. Amen. I will compare if what God has told me is what has been posted outside there. And then I will not be poured out into the philosophy that is in the world. I will not be easily be swept away. I will not be easily misled. Amen. So we are living in a world today where there is a lot of destruction, a lot of, uh, a lot of information. The Bible says, in the last days, knowledge shall increase. Many years ago, it was not easy to travel to the moon. It was not easy to know the distance from the sun to the earth. Today, we know the distance from the sun to the earth. We know the distance from the moon to the sun. Today, we can travel to the moon. It is easy to travel to the moon. It was not like that many years ago. Today, we can travel to places that would take us hours and hours to get there. Knowledge will increase in the last days. Knowledge will increase. Recently, some of us know what was going on in our nation. And the president was addressing us. And he was telling us that in 20 years to come, we shall not be using cars with fuel. Okay? We shall be using cars with electricity. You just charge and drive. Amen. And so knowledge will increase. I know it's time to come. Even the cars of electricity will be phased out. And we shall be using aeroplanes and helicopters. Say amen if you are like me. Amen. I'll be taking you in mind. Amen, children of God. Hallelujah. So knowledge shall increase in the last days. And when knowledge increases, it is very easy for us to be deviated from the truth. It is very easy. Paul wrote and he says that I pray that you will not be taken away from the simplicity that is in Christ. The simplicity that is in Christ. As knowledge increases, it will be very easy for man to divert from divine truth. Because anyway, if you have a brain tumor, 
There are robots that can operate your head, cut the skull into two, enter in there, remove the brain tumor, work on that place very well, cover the skull again, put back your flesh. And you get out of the theater. Amen. You will not feel any pain. Things will be fine. Because knowledge will increase. Today we have these men standing over here on cameras and moving there and there to get the video. But things have changed now. We have robots that are getting video, that are doing the work of a certain man behind there. We have machines that are mopping houses. We have machines that are working as receptionists to receive customers. Amen. And you feel warmly welcome when a machine welcomes you. Praise the Lord. Many years ago, we had over a million workers working with Wumeme. They could move with bills and come to your house with a bill. And they would say, pay the money or we shall disconnect you. Few years back, millions of workers under Wumeme. Today, they are nowhere because of Yaka. Praise the Lord. No one will knock at your gate and say, here is your bill for power. We are going to disconnect you. No. No one will come there. All those workers were laid off. They are nowhere to be seen today. Knowledge will increase. Amen. But as knowledge increases, divine truth must stand. Divine truth must stand. Yes, a robot can cut your head into two, can break and cut through your skull and remove that brain tumor. But that does not change the divine truth that says, I forgive all your sins and heal all your diseases. Praise the Lord. Yes, I can go on that platform. I can Google anything that I want to know. I can Google it and get it. But that does not change the divine truth that says, I will send the Holy Spirit unto you and he will teach you all things. And today, it becomes easier to relate with Google than to relate with the Holy Spirit. Say amen. Say amen. Say amen. amen. And so when we see where we are going, we come to realize that there is need for us children of God to understand the mind of God. Because time will come when men are being swayed away with all that is happening. And then when we are swayed away with what we see, with what we hear, with what is around us, divine truth will not stand. And that will be a falling away. It is what we call a falling away. When we don't stand by what God says. Hallelujah. So going back to Romans chapter 5, where we read, Romans chapter 8 rather, verse 5, the Bible told us that for those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh, that word flesh there does not mean your physical body. Neither does it mean a fallen nature. That word flesh means to live according to what you see, to what you hear, to what you feel. Amen. Those who live according to what they see, according to what they hear, according to what they feel, 
The Bible says they set their minds on that. And then the Bible is saying, but those who live according to the spirit, that word spirit there is divine truth. For the Bible says that the words that you hear, they are spirit and they are life. So they that live according to divine truth, the Bible says they set their minds on the things of God, on the things of of divine truth. And now listen to verse 6. What it says. Verse 6 says. For to set your mind. On the things. That you see. Or to be carnally minded. Is death. Wow. Say amen. The Bible is saying. For to be carnally minded. Is I want to hear you. To be carnally minded is to, that word carnally literally it does not mean living in sin. It doesn't mean living in sin, fornicating or stealing or cheating or hating. That word carnal there or carnally it means to live by the standard of the flesh. To live by what I see what I feel what I smell, if I don't smell it, then it is not it. Amen. If I don't see it, then it is not it. Hallelujah. To live by the standard of the world in simplicity. Because the world is the physical realm in which we live. So when I live by the standard of the world, the Bible says you are in the world, but you are not of the world. So to be carnally minded is not only thinking of fornicating or killing or stealing. But if I can only live a life where everything that I do or any decision that I make is because of what I see, it is carnality. Hallelujah. It is carnality. It is living a carnal mind. For example, I can only buy a wedding gown when a man has proposed it to me. Say amen, singles. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's living by what I see. Living by what I see. I can only get a driving permit when I have bought a car. Hallelujah. So, that is living by what I see, by what I feel, by what I hear. So the Bible is saying, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. To set my mind on what God says is life and peace. The reason why many believers, Christians today, they are living a life of worry and anxiety and fear and depression and oppression, it is right there. Not setting the mind on what God says. Because when I set my mind on what God says, I will not live in fear for a job. I will not live in fear for a child. I will not be anxious. I will not be depressed because I've spent two years in marriage and I'm not getting a child. No, I will not be depressed. I will not leave my wife and get another one because this one is not producing. No. It will not happen. But that does happen when I set my mind on the things of the flesh. Praise the Lord. So the Bible is saying, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. When I set my mind on what God says, I live in the fullness of life. I live in the fullness of peace. This is what the doctor has said, but this is what God says. And I live by that standard. Hallelujah. 
This is what the pocket is saying, but this is what God says. And I live by that standard. This is what my age, physical age, is saying, but this is what God says. And I live by that standard. Amen, children of God. Amen, children of God. This is what is written about my biological family, whatever it is. But this is what God says. And I live by that standard. This is what my husband is saying. But this is what God says. Fearfully and wonderfully made. Hallelujah. This is what the people around me are saying. But this is what God says. This is what the economy is saying. But this is what God says. Praise the Lord. This is what the doctors and the professors are saying. But this is what God says. Praise the Lord. Living a life where what God says to you is above what you see or what you hear or what you smell, even what you dreamt. And that is the plan of God. Right from the beginning, that was the plan of God. God created man and he wanted him to live by divine truth. He never wanted man to live by physical reality. It was never in the plan of God. Because God understands that when we live by physical reality, it is easier to be deceived. When you go through the scriptures, in the days of Moses when he was liberating Israel out of Egypt, the Bible says every miracle that he made, Moses was, that he made, even the magicians of Pharaoh made them. When Moses turned the water into blood, the magicians turned the water into blood. So, to a believer, to a Christian, who does not differentiate divine truth and physical reality, it will be hard for him to make a decision on who is true. Who is true? The Bible says in Exodus chapter 7 verse 11, but Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, so the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their, in, in, what is that word? Enchantments. Amen. Verse 12. Every man threw his rod and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. Amen, children of God. Before the rod of Aaron swallows the serpents of the magicians, the reality is they also made serpents. They also threw the rod the way Aaron threw it and it became a serpent. Now it's upon the believer to know that what the serpents that they have made, my serpent is able to swallow them. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now that is divine truth. That is divine truth. Something else happened. Verse 13. Let's move on. Verse 13. And Pharaoh's heart grew hard and he did not heed them as the Lord had said. So this non-believer Pharaoh, he says, if my magicians can do what you did, I think I don't need you. Praise the Lord. We are entering into a season where men will perform miracles. They will call fire from heaven. They'll command earthquakes and they come. They'll speak to the rain and it comes. Hallelujah. We are entering into those moments, in those days, not very far from now, where men will be able to speak to things and they appear. Hallelujah. But now the issue comes to the believer 
who cannot differentiate between divine truth and physical reality. You can go to a man and he will tell you everything around about you from the day you were born until now. He can read everything. He has every information about you. But now the challenge is, how is this believer going to be able to stand and differentiate that this is a physical reality, but there is a divine truth? Hallelujah, children of God. Verse 14, Exodus 7. The Lord said, so the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hard. He refuses to let the people go. 15. Go to Pharaoh in the morning when he goes out to the water and you shall stand by the river's bank to meet him. And the road which was turned to a serpent you shall take into your hand. 16. And you shall say to him, the Lord God of the Hebrews has sent me to you, saying, let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. But indeed until now you would not hear. Let's go on. Verse 17, thus says the Lord, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will strike the waters which are in the river with the rod that is in my hand, and they shall be turned to blood. 18, and the fish that is in the river shall die. The river shall stink. The Egyptians will lose to drink the water of the river. 19, then the Lord spoke to Moses, said to Aaron, Take your rod and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their streams, over their rivers, over their ponds, and over all their pools of water that they may become blood. And there shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in buckets of wood and in pitchers of stone. Twenty. And Moses and Aaron did so, just as the Lord commanded. So he lifted up the rod, struck the waters that they were in the river, in the sight of Pharaoh, and in the sight of his servants, and all the waters that were in the river, we are turned to blood. 21. The fish that was in the river died. The river stank. The Egyptians could not drink the water of the river. So there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. 22. Then the magicians. Then the... Say, then the magicians. Then the magicians of Egypt did so with their attachments. And Pharaoh's heart grew hard, and he did not heed them as the Lord had said. Then the magicians also turned water into blood. They turned water into blood. Hallelujah. The story goes on. Moses goes back to God again and says, things have not worked. Things have not worked. 23. Things have not worked. Verse 23. Verse 24. Their issue became an issue in Egypt. Water was already blood. Now the Bible says a time came where God told Moses to make frogs. The same thing happened with the magicians. They also made Frogs. So whatever Moses did, they did. So it was not a simple thing for Moses to come up with a decision that this is God. Neither was it a simple thing for the children of Israel who were in Egypt that time to say that Moses has been sent by God. Chapter 8 verse 7. And the magicians did so. Let's begin from verse 6. Exodus chapter 8, verse six, 5. Okay. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your hand with your rod over the streams, over the rivers, over the ponds, and cause frogs to come up on the land of Egypt. Before we continue, do you realize that these miracles were made by Aaron? Amen. They are made by Aaron. Because Moses was telling Aaron, to do what the Lord told him. Amen. The Lord spoke to Moses, said to who? To Aaron. Even the other verses said, said to Aaron. Verse 6. So Aaron stretched forth his hand. Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. Verse 7. 
And what? And what? And the magicians did so with their encouragements and brought up frogs from the land of Egypt. Brought up frogs. So Moses calls, turns the rod into a serpent. They throw their sticks, they also turn into serpents. Moses turns water into blood, they turn water into blood. Moses calls the frogs, they also call the frogs. Hello? Hello, children of God? So you go in the hospital and you tell the sick person to get out of the bed and they walk. And another man comes and says, God is not true. God is not there. And, says, and you say, why is, is he not true? He says, no, I can also command this sick person to rise up. Hallelujah. And the man says, okay, you, rise up from the bed and walk. And the sick man also gets up from the bed and he begins to walk. How will you defend the truth that you know? Because what you are doing, another man is able also to do it. Hallelujah. This is the issue that happened in Egypt. That they were able to see the snakes made by the magicians. They were able to see the water turn into blood. They were able to see the frogs come, both by Aaron's rod and by the magicians. They were able to see them. Now, God does not want us to live by physical reality. He wants us to live by divine truth. Say amen. He wants us to live by divine truth. God wants me and you to live a life where what he says is the final, regardless of what I see. Whether a magician makes frogs, God is God. Hallelujah. Whether they turn water into blood, what God said is final. Say amen. And this is the life that God wanted us to live in Eden. The Bible says in the book of Genesis, after God creating Adam, he took him into the garden and he planted there two trees in the garden of Eden. He planted two trees in the garden of Eden. He took the man there and he told the man that on the, all the trees in the garden you can eat, but on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. Because on the day you shall eat of it, you shall do what? Can we read together? Genesis chapter 2 verse 17. One, two, three, go. I'm not hearing you. I want you to read as a child of God. One, two, three, go. You shall not. For in the day, what will happen? Amen. So God says, there are two trees in the garden. Verse 16. There are two trees that God put in the garden. The Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. And in verse 17, he says, verse 17, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. Now there is a tree of life and there is a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In the garden, God planted two trees. I think it's verse 15 there. He planted two trees in the garden. Out and out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow in the, that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of what? Can, you, can I hear you? The tree of? That is one tree. Was in the middle of the garden. And the tree of? The tree of the knowledge of good and? So there are two trees there. According to Exodus chapter, Genesis chapter 2 verse 9. There is a tree of life and a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So God says of every tree you can eat but the tree. Of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. Because the day you'll eat on that tree, you'll start to live by physical reality. Amen. The day you eat on that tree. He says the day you eat on that tree, you shall die. The day you eat on that tree, you shall die. And this is what Paul said in Romans chapter 8 verses 5. 
He says, for to those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. Verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death. And God is telling Adam in Eden, when you eat on this tree, you shall die. And Paul is saying, this is the death that the Lord was meaning. For to be carnally minded is death. Hallelujah. To live by what I see, to live by what I feel, to live by what is around me is death. And God from the beginning wanted us to live by the principle of divine truth. He never wanted man to live by what they see. Because when I live by what I see, things will not work well for me. When I live by what I see, that is not the standard of God. And so the serpent in chapter 3 of Genesis comes to the woman and says, what did God say? What did God tell you? What did God say? And she gave her, she gave her explanation to the devil, to the serpent, what God said. God said, the day we eat on it, we shall surely die. And the serpent tells the woman, you will not die. You will not die. God knows that the day you eat on that tree, the day you eat on that fruit, your eyes will open. Hallelujah. Your eyes will open. You shall be like God. Knowing good and evil. God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. You will be like him, knowing good and evil. That is what the serpent told the woman. Say, God is hiding something from you. He's hiding something from you. So what God said is death, the devil says it is what? Opening of the eyes. God says you will die. The devil says no, your eyes will be opened. Your eyes will be opened. You will be a mere man. Hallelujah. You live a standard by what you see. God is calling us this morning to get out of a system where we live by what we see, by what we hear, by what we feel, but we live by divine truth. Amen, children of God. It is even good for you to come to church and listen to my sermon preach to you and every other preacher preach to you and go on that internet and, and listen to any man or woman preach unto you. But can you have time and get that book and read it and believe what is there? Amen. And believe what is there. Believe what is there. Can you get time and sit alone with that Bible and you read and say, yes, God, this is what you said, I go by it. This is what you said, I go by it. Not what I heard from Pastor Matthias. Not what I heard from so and so, but I have read it for myself. It is written in here. I believe it. Say amen. I believe it. Living a life where what God says is above what we see or hear. What God says to you is final. To you it is final. There is a situation that happened in the days of Jesus. The Bible says one day Jesus went and he was praying with his disciples. And after praying, they were walking back. In Matthew chapter 16. With his disciples. From verse 13. He came into the region of Caesarea. With his disciples. In Philippi. And then he asked his disciples saying. Who do men say that I the son of man am? He was walking with his ministers. The twelve of course, there were more than that when we go through the scriptures. But he comes to this and says, 
Who do men say that I am? And everyone gave an answer in verse 14. The Bible says, so they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Okay? So they tell Jesus that the men out there, they told us that that is Elijah. Others said, no, he is John the Baptist. And others said, no, I think he's Jeremiah. He's Jeremiah. And then the Bible says in verse 15, Jesus said to the disciples, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? When we read the Bible, that statement seems to be, anyway, easy. Jesus asked them, who do you think that I am? Many times, we take it the way it is. Jesus turned to them and asked them, who do you think? Who do you say that I am? What is your confession about me? Now, when we read that verse, something must come into our mind. That the 12 disciples lived with Jesus, ate with Jesus, bathed with Jesus, slept with Jesus, walked with Jesus. They saw the physical Jesus that we did not see. It is easier for me today to believe in Jesus because I've never seen his earthly life. Amen. Amen. Yeah, thank God for those movies of those great men that have tried to bring out a, a glimpse, not the fullness, but something simple for us to know in, in, in video form, eh, the passion of Christ, those, those movies, you've watched them. Thank God for those movies. But I was sharing with some people and I told them that there is something, however good those movies of Jesus are, they are good, I appreciate the work done. But there is a lot of information that is not in those movies concerning the real life of Jesus on earth. For example, in those movies, we don't see Jesus bathing. We don't see Jesus taking a shower. And those days there were no bathrooms. Hello? In those movies, we don't see Jesus going to the toilet. And in those days, there were no toilet paper. Yeah? Yeah? Hello? Mm -hmm. Say amen. We don't see those things. In those movies, we don't see Jesus walking 10 kilometers, 50 kilometers, and he has sweated, and then he's invited for another preaching somewhere, and he has, he's smelling, there is that scent come, coming out of him, and in those days, there were no perfumes. There were no deodorants, the way we have today. So the disciples knew the real Jesus. They knew what it means. It was a stumbling block. The Bible says the stone that the builders rejected has become the corner stone. Hallelujah. The man of old that walked physically with Jesus it would take faith for them to confess that you are God. Amen. It would take faith for Thomas to confess that you are God. So he comes to them and he said, but who do you say that I am? The physical reality is we saw you going to the toilet. The physical reality is we saw you walk and you sweated and you are smelling. 
The physical reality is we saw you eating food and you added yourself a second plate and you gave a scripture that the journey is too long. Hallelujah, rise up and eat for the journey is too long. Praise the Lord. They had physical reality of this man. And so Jesus said, who do you say that I am? And I see Matthew turning to James and say, James, <laughs> you say something. Who do you say this guy is? The way you saw him falling from the mountain when we are, climb, we are descending down. And his robe turned and covered the head. Who do you say that he is? And James said, Matthew, leave me. Leave me alone. Maybe you ask Levi. I say, Levi, did you hear the question? Uh -huh. Leave me alone. Praise the Lord. They, saw, they had physical reality. They saw the man become tired. They saw the man wanting to eat food. They saw the man go to the toilet, as I have explained to you. Some of those things, when we talk about Jesus, they don't come into our mind. I think we just see a man putting on white, white shoes, white apparel, a beautiful watch. Hallelujah. And he comes and says, for God so loved the world and he sent me that whoever believes in me should not perish. We don't see those things. We don't see that reality. We don't go back and put ourselves in the shoes of John, in the shoes of Matthew, in the shoes of Judas, Judah Iscariot. We don't put ourselves there. But the truth, the reality is they saw the physical man who was like them. Isaiah wrote about him and he said when you see him there is nothing on him that you would admire. Nothing. That's why it was even not easy for the high priests to arrest Jesus at night because you could not know whether he was the one. They needed a Judah Iscariot to go and kiss the man. That is how Jesus was. That is how he was. Because if they knew who exactly, if it was that easy to get him and identify him, they would not need a Judah Iscariot. They would just come at night and find him among the 12 and grab him. But the man, you could not even know that he's the one. But these men, the Bible says where we read, verse 16, Matthew chapter 16, verse 16. Simon Peter answered and said, Hallelujah. Simon Peter answered and said, I have seen you bathing. I have seen you going to the toilet. I have seen you sweating. I have seen you sleeping and you snore up to morning. I have seen you hit yourself on the stone and you fall down. I have seen you crying. I have seen you laugh and even lift up your leg. But you are the Christ. Now if you are clapping for God, do it better. He said, I have the physical reality, but I have the divine truth. There is a lot that I can look at and say you are not God. Everything around you does not prove that you are God. But according to the scriptures, you are the Christ. You are the Christ. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And the Bible says in verse 17, Jesus looked at Simon Peter and he answered him and said, Blessed are you, Simon, the son of Jonah. For physical reality, flesh and blood has not revealed 
this to you. You have not said that I am the Christ because of what you've seen around me. The truth is everything around me, in it, there is nothing that can prove to you that I'm the Christ. But he said, this has come to you by my Father who is in heaven. Child of God, our Father wants us to live a life of divine truth. I don't know what is around you. I don't know what you see. But God's desire is that we live beyond what we see. We live beyond what we hear. We live beyond what we smell. We live beyond what is written concerning us on our reports, on our examination results. God wants us to live a life where what he says is above what we see. What he says is above what we see. And that is his heart's desire. That is his heart's desire. That even if everyone around you has died, you can still stand and say, I'm not going to die. Because 10,000 will fall this side, hundreds of thousands this side, but none of those pandemics shall come near me. Hallelujah, children of God. None of those pandemics shall come near me. I will stand out. I'll believe what God said, regardless of what is around me. Faith. Faith is not ignoring the physical reality. Faith is believing what God said in the presence of the physical reality. I don't assume that it will be well. No, I know it will be well. Praise the Lord. I don't think that tomorrow will be better. No, I know it will be better. I know it. I don't wish that one day I'll become pregnant or I'll enter in marriage. I don't assume oh, I imagine the day I'll put on a wedding gown. I imagine the day I'll enter in my house. I'll, I imagine that day when I'll enter into my new car. No, I don't imagine. I don't imagine. I know I'll put on a wedding gown. I know I'll enter my house. I know I'll drive my new car. I know I'll enter in the plane. I know. Hallelujah. I know. We have here a project called CDC and we have children there and caregivers. One day I was talking to them and I told them, make sure you, you, you encourage your children to go to school because we want some of them to be pilots and they will be piloting our planes. And they laughed. Hallelujah. And I told them, I want to sit in my plane and one of your children is my pilot. And they laughed because they thought I was joking. No, I know I'll own a plane. I don't assume it. Now look at your unbelief. Clap better. I know. I know it. And so when, as I say, some days I get, I get some time and I also go on that thing called Google and YouTube and I learn how they pilot a plate. A plane. Because I know I will have one. I go there. Hallelujah. And I learn how they, they, they lift up the helicopter and how they make it to move. I, I go there on YouTube and learn because I know I will own one. Tell your neighbor, what do you go to do on YouTube? <laughs> Hallelujah. I already owned one there, and soon I will have it. So God wants us to live a life where divine truth, divine truth is above physical reality. Divine truth is above physical reality. 
When you look around you, everything seems to be dead. But the one in you is life. The Bible says the first Adam became a living soul, but the second Adam was a life-giving spirit. And that life-giving spirit abides in you. There may be death around you, but in you there is life. There may be impossibilities around us, but in us there is possibility. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, children of God. There may be lack around us, but in us there is abundance. There is abundance. Living by what God says. Living by what God says. A life where divine truth is above physical reality. As you enter into this seven days beginning tomorrow, I want you to set your mind on what God said. Set your mind on what God said. Hallelujah. Set your mind on what God said. When we set our mind on what God said, things will become easy. Each time there is worry in your heart, each time there is fear in our hearts, each time there is anxiety in our hearts, ask yourself, where is my mind? Where is my mind? Where is my mind? How comes fear is raging over my heart? How comes hatred is raging over my heart? How comes something is not right within me? Then I have yielded to what I see. By his stripes, you were healed. Regardless of the sickness that is on your body. Will you believe that? Will you walk by that truth? What if you woke up in the morning and the pain has increased in your stomach? What if you woke up in the morning and the person that you shook hands with and gave a hug, they told you in the morning that she has been admitted in the ICU with the COVID-19. And she's the person that you gave a hug yesterday at night, the last person. Hallelujah, children of God. What if you woke up in the morning and there is this news bulletin on your TV screen or on your smartphone that there is a new virus that is incurable? You woke up in the morning and there is that information on your phone. This is incurable. What are you going to live by? Will you still say, I am still here? I am much paying until he comes. That is the standard where God has called us to live. And Jesus lived by that standard. Everything around him seemed not to depict who he really was. But he stood by what is written about him. And he said, I have come to accomplish that which is written about me. I have not come to live by what I see around me. No, I have come to fulfill that which is written about me. There is what is written about you. Divine truth. Don't fear what the devil brings on your way. Don't fear what you meet on the way. There is what is written about you. There is what is written about your marriage. There is what is written about your children. There is what is written about your finances. There is what is written about your future. Amen. There is what is written about the plants concerning you, about the animals concerning you. There is what is written about nature concerning you and me. There is what is written. And the Bible says you shall know the truth. And the truth. The truth. The truth, the truth, the truth shall set me free from the fear of the doctor's report. Shall set me free from the fear 
of that financial report shall set me free from the fear of that Kilan report. The truth shall set me free from the fear of that examination report. The truth shall set you free from the fear of the store's report. The report from your store. Divine truth over physical reality. I want you to open up your heart and see the way God sees and hear the way God hears. It is not that God doesn't want you to become better. No, God has made you better. There is nothing good that he has hidden from us. No, nothing. Whatever our hearts desire, he has already laid it. And the apostles, many years ago, they made a decision and spoke this word as I conclude in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. Can we read together? One, two, three, go. We regard. Can you read it from your spirit? Can you read it from the spirit? These men who have seen him walk naked, who have seen him go to the toilet, who have seen him sleep and snore, who have seen him eat four plates of food, who have seen him fall while walking. This is the conclusion they made. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. One, two, three, go. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Hallelujah. Now we relate with him as Christ, as the real God. Though we saw him fail, though we saw him sleep, though we saw him do this in the physical, but now we no longer look at him like that. Hallelujah. And they said it is not only Christ that we are not considering in the flesh. They said every man around us. Every man around us. When we look at them, we see the divine ability that is in them. When we look at them, we see the divine nature that they carry. When we look at them, we see the glory, the anointing. We see the power that they carry. We see the inheritance that they carry. When we look at every man, they say from now on we regard no one according to physical reality. No one. That even if they meet a man walking on the road without shoes, and having a trouser with holes, patches, without a shirt, they are saying, even when I meet such a man on the road, I don't take him for granted by what I'm seeing around him or outside him. Even when I meet a Boda Boda riding a bicycle on the road, they are saying from now onwards, we no longer consider anyone according to the flesh. We are no longer considering any man according to what we see around them. They may be short, they may be tall, they may be brown, they may be dark, they may have one eye, or they may not be having hands. But what we see outside, what we see outside, physical reality can never determine the conclusions we make on people. Hallelujah, children of God. They may be educated or not, but what we see outside never determines the conclusion we make. Maybe they failed in class. You are here, you are a parent, 
and your child failed. They were number 20 out of 20 children. And they are saying, today we no longer make conclusions like that. We no longer regard any man according to what we see outside. No. The day Jesus went in the grave and came out from that grave, they made up their mind. And they said, though we saw him and knew him according to the flesh, but now we no longer know him that way. Divine truth has superseded the physical reality. Everything in your body, tell it, I know what the Bible says. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, children of God. Enter into your lecture room and tell the lecture room, I know what God says. Enter into the examination paper and tell that examination paper, I know what the Lord says. Go into the hospital, get the medical report and look at that report that the doctor has told you and tell that report, I know what God. Go to your bank account and check your balance and speak to that bank account and tell it, I know what the Lord says. And I'm going to live by what the Lord says. Even your gardens, even your cows and your goats, look at your cows and tell them, I know what the Lord says. Look at your cabbages and tell them, I know what the Lord says. Hallelujah. Whether there is a drought in the whole world, I know what the Lord says. You shall plant gardens and eat of them. You shall build houses and dwell in them. You shall lend to nations. From now onwards, I live by divine truth, not by physical reality. Hallelujah. 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 Tell your neighbor, now I know who you are. Uh -uh. Tell them, now I know who you are. Not by what I see, but by what I know. Hallelujah. Give Jesus a hand of praise. Stand up on your feet. The day you'll eat on that fruit, you'll die. And Paul says, to be carnally minded is that death. The day you'll eat on that fruit, you'll die. And Paul tells us, for to be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. The day you'll eat on that fruit, you'll die. Tell your neighbor, don't eat on that fruit. Amen. Don't eat on that fruit. Don't live by what you see. Don't live by what you feel, by what you hear or by what you smell. God is calling us this morning to live a life where what he says is above what we see, is above what we hear, is above what we smell. And when we live such a life, we will live in peace. We will live in joy. The reason why you didn't sleep at night is because you didn't believe what God said. That's it. The reason why people walk in war, war and fear is because they choose not to believe what God said. They choose not to believe what God said. You know where it is written in the Bible, but to believe it, to believe it, 
I pray for you from today that your life will be a result of what you believe in God. Everything around you will be an answer to your faith in God. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I pray for you from today. Regardless of the report that you have from the doctor, regardless of the report that you have from your landlord, regardless of the report that you have from your family background, I pray for you today that divine truth will supersede what you hear. Even if they said you have one day to die, the Lord says, you shall not die, but live, but live and declare his goodness. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, even if you yourself open the door for the devil, I pray for you today that divine truth shall supersede physical reality. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Things may not be going the way you want them to go. That is not the end of you. You are going to make it. You are going to get that job. You are going to be married. In the mighty name of Jesus. You will produce the children that you want. Even if they removed your fallopian tubes. Even if you have no ovary within you. That report cannot overwrite divine truth even if you have been in marriage and you are aging 50 years old and you have no child divine truth clearly shows there will be no burden amongst you even at the age of above 80 years your grandmother Sarah conceived and she nursed a child in her old age will you believe that will you believe that truth or would you read it as a story in the Bible? Will you believe that even at above 80 years, Sarah conceived? Will you believe that at the age of 60, you can conceive a child? Will you believe or you receive it as a story in the Bible? All things that we are written, we are written for our learning, that through the patience and the comfort of the scriptures, we may have hope. I declare upon you, whatever God said, so shall stand. So shall it be. I don't know what is around you, but what I know, God is not a son of man to lie. Today you may be living a discouraged life, but there is hope for a tree that has been cut down, that at the scent of the word of God, that at the entrance of the word of God, light will spring on that tree, on that tree that has been cut. That situation that had cut your heart, I pray for you from today, that the word which you've heard today will continue to minister to you, even when you are walking on the road, even when you are sitting in your bedroom, even when you are cooking, even when you are sitting in your lecture room, let these words still dawn into your heart. That what God said shall surely stand above what you see, you hear, and feel around you. Father, we thank you because you are so good and you are so loving. Thank you for this service. Thank you for all of us that came today to worship before you. We give you all the honor and we give you all the glory because you are a good God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for worshiping. Before we conclude, 